Hello, or should I say, down, set, hut, hut. I'm Don Frazier. And I'm Josh Smith. Welcome to Historical Trends. It's a big game weekend deep into the football season, and your favorite team is playing under the lights while you sit in front of your 70-inch TV screen and enjoy. Your surround sound system captures the commentators word for word and blares the crowd noise if you're at the game yourself. It's a tough game, and your team is defending a narrow lead in the final minutes. Your feet finally reach the floor as you creep forward, eyeing the television while saying a silent prayer. You watch as the ball is snapped, and the quarterback drops back looking for a receiver to jump the ball to, putting the nail in the coffin with a game-ending first down. He scans the field, finding a receiver who has broken off his route and sits wide open to his left. Your face falls in your hands, noticing the wide open man as well. The QB aims, cocks back his arm, and throttles a bullet, but out of nowhere, a six foot, 240 pound monster crashes the crown of his helmet right underneath his tent. You rise to your seat as the quarterback falls to the turf, his body attempting to process an unseen blow to the chest as a mixture of crowds and screams and your own joyous cheer fills the room. The pinnacle of highlight plays of football, a big kid. Entertained by yet another hard hitting game, you simply switch the TV off. Confident with your team's victory, but unaware of the true damage done to the fallen quarterback. Wow, you paint a pretty hard picture of America's national obsession. Very colorful. Helmets to the chest, praying. Man, I didn't know it was a religious experience. It's really just all to make a point, which is what we're going to talk about are the football injuries. Right. All right, we'll get a little background on this topic when we return after this break. It all started on Valentine's Day in 1986 when a poor but honest theological student was trying to win the heart of an aspiring pediatrician. He somehow stumbled on the recipe for this unique pie, baked her one, And the rest is history. Rejoice, my friend, for today the rare joy brought by this storied pastry is yours. Pie Masters, your favorite kind of pie. And we're back. Okay, so the violence of football has always been a matter of concern, and the sport has seen many attempts at safety and reform over the years. That's right. I think it's best to start at the beginning of the last century. In November 1905, Vernon Wise, a fullback on Oak Park Junior Varsity football team in Illinois, threw himself at a high part opponent who collapsed on top of him followed by a struggling mass of players. And that's the big dog pile that you always see. Basically. All right. Wise was knocked unconscious yeah. and was dragged off the field and taken to a doctor. The next play, his replacement was kicked in the head, <laughs> but not as badly injured as Wise was. At the doctor's office, Wise soon regained consciousness, but died two hours later from complications of a broken back. <laughs> there were other gridiron casualties. The Alton, Illinois school board banned the sport after the high school's right tackle died in October games. <laughs> Dropping like flies up there in the Alton. Pretty much. Edie Enos of the Alton team also had his collarbone broken in the same game. These weren't the only victims of football injuries. A 16-year-old Chicago kid died of peritonitis after a football game. Peritonitis? Wait, that's usually an abdominal issue. He would have had to have had a ruptured spleen or some sort of mushed guts, like a ruptured liver. Uh, that takes a lot of violence. As a result of the tragedy, the dead boy's father pushed the state legislation to ban the sport. The bodies continued stacking up. Numerous fatalities that were not so famous occurred from 1905 to 1920. It wasn't until 1931 when statistics were regularly kept on football fatalities. Wow. About a year, those numbers would show a pattern of deaths that would occur to the numbers that nearly ended football in America. Wow, so many people are dying, they're just going to ban the game. Yeah, pretty much, and I don't think I really would like that happening. No, that would, your Friday nights and Saturday nights would open up. Big okay. time. In 1905, the great president Theodore Roosevelt, a huge football fan, called up a team of coaches and athletic advisors from Harvard University, Yale University, and Princeton University to the White House to discuss how to improve the game of football. 
He helped usher in a new era of football rules and precautions, and most important safety feature, of course, would be the helmet. Ah, yeah, let's put helmets on these guys. Yeah, the idea of protecting the head in football by constructing padded headwear would change the game entirely. The NCAA made helmets mandatory in 1939, according to the anatomy of the game of football, the rules, and the men who made the game, which was written by David M. Nielsen. And the NFL required helmets in 1943, which would definitely be needed. It's nice for them to kind of, you know, catch up on the trend. The death rate declined after these safety changes, correct? Yes, it did. But the severity of the injuries happened to continue, especially as football players got beefier. Compare these images of football players in the 1960s to the beefiness of the football players today. Yes, a lot more beef on the bone. So you put a helmet on their head. But then you throw a much bigger weapon at them. Yeah, so it's, I'm it's, not a, sure. it's, yeah. A, it's a big difference. There's a little being bit nice of disconnect there, yeah. Speaking of the 1960s, between 1965 and 1969, more than 100 players at all levels died of football injuries. Nice. An average of about 20 a year, about the same number that died in the early 1900 period. But now these players were dying from brain injuries alone. The work of the University of Michigan neuroscientist Richard Schneider during the 1960s led to the significant equipment and rule changes that altered the sport, and it profoundly made it safer, at least for the time being. Schneider made a lab model at the University of Michigan to study head and neck injuries, of these, and these experiments ultimately leading to the development of the protective helmets used today. So it's almost like a crash test dummy. Pretty much. Okay. The change was extraordinary. Between rule changes and the 1973 creation of the NOCSAE, the National Operating Committee for Standards for Athletic Equipment. Head injury fatalities in football declined by three quarters. Wow. So the issue of football-related brain trauma, which has made headlines in recent years, is really nothing new. That's right. However, while data compiled from the head impact telemetry system, or HITS, captures the extreme physical forces at work during a football game, it's not uncommon for a player to sustain the equivalent of a 25-mile-per-hour crash at impact. <laughs> Recent neurological findings have shown that the severity of head injuries is only indirectly related to the actual force of the hit. Sometimes players get up from big hits, but it doesn't mean that they're actually affected from such force. <laughs> wow. That explains all the little stars and circles and Tweety Birds <laughs> going yeah. around their head. All right. So we are now talking about concussions, right? We've moved away from exploded livers. Now we're talking about bruised brains. Yeah, the biggest thing with head injuries. And other organs are easy to protect with padding yeah. or with physical conditioning, but heads in the brain are a little trickier. Well, the nothing but bone, hit, man. Yeah. The big hit that we love so much in football often gets blamed for the RAS concussions and the head injuries and mental problems. But what has been shown recently at research at Purdue suggests that the culprit behind these hits is the number of times the player gets hit throughout Plus, the course of the season. Not the one big hit. Not the one big hit, the but multiple hit over, hits. over and over and over again. So not the terrible blow, it's the repeated blow mm -hmm. to the noggin over the months and years of a season and a career. Okay. Exactly. It appears so. One of the biggest discoveries as a result of these hits is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, an Alzheimer's-like disease found in formal football players. Yikes. The disease was known to occur in people who had experienced repeated hits to the head, such as boxers and seen in hockey players and wrestlers, as well as military veterans. Yeah, I'm thinking of Muhammad Ali. Exactly. His declining years, okay. Lots of hits to the head. Yeah. But it was actually found in their later 40s to 70s. But a new study found CTE in football players. CTE is basically the disorientation of what is known as tau proteins in the brain. What they do is they move nutrients and materials from one part of the brain cell to another. But after head trauma, tau proteins can be changed, causing thread-like tangles that jam up the transport system. Wow. These tangles can cause complications in the prefrontal cortex, which is the area involved in decision-making, emotion, behavior. So CT vitamins are more likely to cause moody, aggressive, and depressive. Wow. Some so commit suicide or some actually attempt to. Wait, does this explain some of the weird behavior of, like, professional football players? Exactly. So when people think that some football players are so crazy, to a degree, they actually are from so many hits to the because head. Because they've got nothing but a knotted because up tangle got of threads but a in their skull. Tangle of threads in their skull. Wow, that's amazing. Diseases like CTE and injuries that have occurred over time have presented themselves as 
reasons to end the game of football, but continuous efforts by doctors, scientists, and just pure football lovers keep the game alive by creating a much safer way to play. Okay. So this is fascinating, Josh. I'm interested in this tangle of knots and people's <laughs> skulls and uh, things like that. But you're a football player. You're a linebacker. Yes, I've I seen am. you play. I've seen you deliver the big hit. <laughs> so uh, you've got a real interest in this topic. You've got skin in this game, so mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, really, we're talking about your head here. Okay. We will discuss this some more after this break. McMurray University, founded in 1923 as a United Methodist institution, is a student-centered community that empowers its graduates to lead lives of meaning through scholarship, leadership, and service. McMurray University is located in Abilene, Texas, about 150 miles west of Dallas-Fort Worth. McMurray University has over 10,000 alumni living all over the United States, as well as in 11 different countries. With over 1,200 students, McMurray offers over 40 clubs and organizations and 19 NCAA intercollegiate sports. McMurray University offers over 45 academic majors, including 10 pre-professional programs with a 13 to 1 student to faculty ratio. The 52 acre campus located in the heart of Abilene offers opportunities to explore the beautiful West Texas area. Ninety percent of McMurray students receive financial aid. McMurray University was listed as number 18 on the list of best regional colleges west by the U.S. News and World Report in 2015. For more information, visit admissions.mcm.edu or call 325-793-4700. All right, we're back. We got some questions that have uh, arisen over this topic. Why don't you Alrighty. help us field these? When was the first football game? I mean, you know, I'm kind of curious on when did we decide that it'd be a good idea to put big beefy guys running into each other at high velocity? Where did it come from? What are the origins of this American sport? Well, actually, on November 6, 1869, Rutgers and Princeton played um, the first college football game. Huh. So that's that's just after the American Civil War. Exactly. What was that first football game like? Um, well, it was more of a rugby type of football okay. to a certain degree. It wasn't actually until towards the 1890s, towards the 1900 period, that it actually um, improved with helmets and certain gear and rules and a line of scrimmage that developed it into the football game that we have today. So it was just kind of a controlled brawl. Exactly. All right, so rub rugby goes pretty far back in the British Isles. Mm -hmm. You know, now there's... Uh, Gaelic football mm -hmm. and Hurley and other sorts of hybrid game or games that I think probably influenced the development of American football. I'm just wondering, is there an, is there an originator? Is there somebody that thought it up and said, hey, let's play this game called football? Well, actually, the day that it, all, that it goes far enough back to um, in 1869, like sure. I was saying, with Rutgers and Priskin playing, the beginning of all football started simply as rugby, as putting the pigskin down, this oversized lob shaped ball yeah. and running into the guy in front of you trying to escort the ball from one side of a field to another side. Boy, tug of war without the rope. Exactly. Okay, you just put the rope into a ball. Interesting. All right, so what was some of the first football gear? Um, It's a lot different than the gear that they actually have today. It started with soft leather, very thin helmet, like canvas, mm -hmm. Um, very wow. weird, tight, sewn on pants. And um, basically, the shirts that they wore were a lot like sweaters. Hmm. So not a lot of padding in the early football gear at all. No mouthpieces. Um, cleats weren't um, actually introduced until later on in the years. It was usually just regular shoes on grass. Wow. So not a lot of thinking into gear just earlier on. Just close the brawl by. Just close the brawl by. All right. So it's essentially young men that have a lot of high-strung, pent-up energy. Exactly. They're just pounding on each other. And don't even think about the pain until afterwards. Yeah, no kidding. That's amazing. You know, I, I wonder, um, we talked about head injuries and things like that. 
I wonder if people didn't wear helmets, if that would reduce the head-to-head -head contact. I mean, it seems like if you put a big, you know, case on somebody's head that you've just weaponized their skull. Mm -hmm. Well, you could think that, but to a certain degree, people were crazy enough to think, well, I don't have a helmet on. I'm still going to hit him in the head. Yeah, I guess Which, in the in the moment, I don't get in the really moment you're not about really that. thinking about Having it. Having never played football, I mean, <laughs> other than you know, Sandlot football, mm -hmm. I've never actually had the uh, image of somebody looming into my face mask <laughs> pre impact. That's something you've done well, most time. of your life. Yeah, yeah, it's something that you kind of look forward to. Honestly, that's, that's you know, different taste than mine. All <laughs> right, so why do you think football is so popular? Well, since the beginning of time, even back to the Roman days, we have, as people, have always just liked watching people fight with so this, gladiators. So and, this is gladiatorial it's blood sport. Basically, putting a ball down with the burliest of men in our community and watching them go head to head as a team effort to move a ball from one side of the field to another. Is it simulated combat? To a certain degree, it's actually gotten to a point where it appears to be combat, when players are a lot more aggressive and. Um, how they play and the actions they do and the moves and the technique that they have, it becomes, to agree, um, controlled combat. All right, so I'm a history dork, not a cool football player like <laughs> you, but when I see the uh, teams line up, I'm reminded of, you know, Greco-Roman -War warfare. I mean, where mm -hmm. they're lining up and this guy's covering this guy and that guy's covering the next guy, sort of like a um, uh, phalanx, mm -hmm. and then y'all smash into each other. I mean, the way the Greeks fought a battle, was to push the other people back. Exactly. Yeah, and so what you would do is you'd get the shield and you'd put it into the small of the back of the guy in front of you. Mm -hmm. And you'd push him into the enemy in front of them until you finally pushed them all the way off the battlefield. Exactly. So it looks a lot like the offensive and defensive exactly line. Exactly like the O and D line. Yeah, and that's pretty amazing. All right, so we're going to take another little break and then we've got questions from viewers. All right. We'll be right back. Well, I have very vivid memories um, in our living room with a little black and white TV and watching Walt Disney's King of the Wild Frontier. And then, of course, John Wayne in 60. That, that film just blew me away, the music. I saw the movie pretty much as much as I could. I've read pretty much every Alamo book that's out there. You know, so I want the book. I hope the book will be taken seriously. I've tried to write it as I would write anything, you know, so it's, I don't want to pretend to be someone I'm not. I know what they, these documents are and what the artifacts are, but sometimes it takes somebody else to, when their excitement about the importance of something, you know, then you start to realize that you've got quite an impressive collection of stuff. The State House have been very, very good to me. Don Fraser, Steve Harden, and Claudia. There's a lot of time and energy and, and uh, thought gone into it and will be going into it to present it as a, a really good looking respectable book as opposed to something that's just thrown together. There are others out there that are far more knowledgeable about it but, uh, but I'm enthusiastic. All right, we're back. Now we've got some viewers that have asked questions, and we're going to try to field them. I'm going to need help here because, again, you're the hoss. Lay them on me. Just me. All right, so how has technology gotten better to prevent injuries? We've kind of covered this, mm -hmm. but let's talk about helmets. Okay, one of the biggest things that has changed uh, recently in technology with football is this new Vice Zero One helmet technology. Wow. Um, basically, what it uses is different sorts of padding, and what they've done is um, found a new technique of how to pad the helmet in certain regions of the brain that, through studies, have been affected the most through combat. All right, so that's probably those helmets I see with sort of the slits going along. Looks kind of funny looking. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, because we went from kind of having smooth helmets to mm -hmm. now all of a sudden it looks like almost race car technology it's, or something. It's rigid um, to the fact where it can be a lot aerodynamic, but it's padding enough to take that punch. Oh, wow. That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. 
So here's another viewer question. This is from Chuck Roast. And uh, it says, why should kids still be allowed to play football? One of the biggest things, and um, I've had this question a lot by um, parents um, back when I used to play, and they would ask me, you know, well, why should I still let my kid play football with you know, all the injuries um, happening and things like that? Um, the biggest thing with certain organizations like um, USA Football and Heads Up Football, yeah. they're actually finding ways to make the game safer with um, form tackling and um, keeping heads up during blocks and certain things like that. So there are a lot of people investing time and effort into making the game safer. But Josh, shouldn't we be sending our young men to play chess or learn the cello? Why are we taking them and saying, why don't we launch you at another guy's kid at a high velocity until y'all become just kind of a pulp down there in the middle of the field? Well, contrary to popular belief, football huh. isn't all about just running into somebody entirely. But what it teaches you is um, teamwork. Huh. And it toughens you up as a man in today's society. And forces you to depend on somebody next to you or the man in front of you to bear down and do their job in order for you to do your job to um, work as one as a team, in essence, to have victory or success. All right, so it builds character. Exactly. And builds team techniques and things mm -hmm. like that. Okay, so that's the, that's the positive that offsets all the potential negative is what you're saying. Exactly. Okay, I'll, I'll buy that. All right, so this is also related to helmets. And this comes from Rick O'Shea. When do you know if you have a concussion? Well, um, one of the biggest things that um, we go through whenever we um, start the beginning of the season, yeah. when we meet with our trainers or certain doctors, they give us a list of certain um, things to check for after a big hit to let you know where they have a concussion. And these include loss of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you're passed out, that <laughs> might be your first out, that, that'd be huh. a big idea that you might have a he concussion. He don't call, he don't write. I don't know what's <laughs> going on with him. All right, go ahead. Along with that would be um, drowsiness, um, confusion, <laughs> duh, duh. a yeah. throbbing headache entirely, yeah, um, nausea, um, vomiting, or blurred vision. Yikes. That's either college night at guitars or concussion. <laughs> we can't tell which. All right. Yeah. All right. So what about loss of memory? Does that come in there too? That's actually a very big problem with concussions. Um, it's very difficult to tell the difference between a concussion and simply just a heart that leads to a headache. But um, when you take a big hit on the football field and you can, you're kind of dizzy or you're walking funny, they bring you to the side and you go through a test. And you'll basically go through a memory test where they'll show you some numbers or some shapes. And at the end of that test, you have to go back and basically just do total recall of things you've seen. And wow. the result of a concussion would be you basically fail that memory test awfully. You mean I may be living with a concussion now? You might just have a concussion <laughs> right now. <laughs> Chronic concussion <laughs> syndrome. All right, sorry. So what has been the most grievous injury that you've ever suffered in your football career? Actually, the worst injury that I've ever had has been like a pulled groin. That is, that's, that's as bad as it gets, which a lot of people will be surprised with the position I play in, um, the numerous times that I'm having to hit somebody. But the thing about football, when you have the right coaching and um, um, the right people to teach you technique, yeah. you learn to maneuver around those big, burly, just muscle plays. Yeah. And it's a game of finesse to a certain degree. Well, you're so, a middle linebacker, aren't you? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I've seen you kind of out there pirouetting and spinning <laughs> around and stuff. It's not like some of the other players, like we had a lineman on this show. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he just hits and pushes, hits and pushes, and it seems like there's a lot more stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So just to pull groin. Yeah, that's as bad as it's gotten. That's from running. So. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I try to avoid. <laughs> All right. Uh, what is your biggest fear, then, as a football player? Um, I guess... I won't say fear because in football you can't fear anything. No, but you're fearless. I guess I'm the sorry. biggest. How silly of me to assume <laughs> that you might be afraid of anything. I guess the biggest hazard to be aware of would basically be, you know, the spine and brain injuries. Uh, yeah. You know, of that head on head contact. So when you flow outside and it's you and that running back looking right at each other, you know, you want to hit them as hard as you can to make them feel you. But the biggest thing is to know, you know, keep your eyes and your head up to avoid, you know, that contact, that helmet to helmet, crown to crown contact, that could easily be the end of your career. Can we just do that playing flag football? Does it have to be so violent? I don't know. It's not quite as fun. I guess. All right. So, why do you do it? I think the biggest thing, like I said earlier, with what it teaches kids about, you know, um, 
teamwork and relying on other people and holding yourself accountable um, as a leader of a team. And the football um, itself, it builds character. It, it builds a, a strength itself, you know, awareness of um, who you are and as a man. So I just, I feel like the game, what it has done for me and as long as I fell in love with it, as it's made me a better person, a better man. It's made me tougher and it made me feel more of a leader. Mental discipline in there somewhere? Entirely. Time management? Big time. Turning stuff in when you're supposed to, things like that. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. All those are positive benefits. And you get into a routine it's of exactly. going in the, into the weight room and all that. When was the? How old were you when you first strapped on pads? When I first strapped up, I was about six years old. Dang. Little peewee football. So I've loved it for a long time. As soon as I strapped up that helmet, that, those oversized shoulder pads and the knee pads that went down to your calves. And <laughs> as soon as I got out there and just, you know, being able to almost legally hit people was just something that I fell in love with, along with, you know, the coaching and, you know, the applause from the crowd. And as I grew older, the, you know, the, the small things, the intangibles that come with playing football. And just from that point on, it's just something I just am addicted to. Bound to be an adrenaline rush when you're getting ready to get in, get into the game and exactly. you know, run out there onto the field. Uh, that's pretty remarkable. All right, well, that's about all the time we have. And so I appreciate you coming in Not a problem. and having this conversation. Uh, fascinating. Fascinating. It'll be interesting to watch your career. <laughs> all right, for Historical Trends, I'm Don Frazier. And I'm Josh Smith. Thanks for watching. <laughs>